Thank you very much for asking me to speak. Um, as Emma says, my name's Keith Ridge. Um, I'm the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer at NHS England. Basically, it's the sort of pharmacy equivalent of the CMO. Um, so, and the um, role isn't just NHS England. Um, I support uh, government, uh, all government departments, um, NHS Improvement, HEE, uh, and the system as a whole. Um, and I'm glad to say I have quite a team to do that, so uh, that, that sort of helps. In terms of my background, um, again, I don't know if you know much about me, but I was once a proper pharmacist um, and um, a proper chief pharmacist in that I was chief pharmacist in Glasgow for about five years uh, in North Glasgow Trust when there were such things in, in Scotland. Um, and um, I've also been chief pharmacist at a place called University Hospitals Birmingham. Um, and prior to that, uh, a session also at the Department of Health um, when I um, helped do things such as set up NICE, um, that was in the 90s. Um, and before that, um, a proper hospital pharmacist and I've practiced in all areas of pharmacy. Um, so that's a bit about me. Uh, since about 2013, a number since NHS England was established, a number of us, a number of the chief officers were transferred from the Department of Health to uh, NHS England, with the exception actually of the CMO, um, uh, because Sally's role is in legislation. Um, and But across the system, then the chief professional officers were, were moved into the NHS, um, and each of us have this system wide role. So I'm going to spend about sort of 30, 40 minutes to sort of take you through where we are policy-wise around what it says on the, on the tin there um, in terms of um, optimising medicines, use, value and funding. Indeed, the word optimising, I'd hope, sort of signals to you um, that this isn't just about the money, um, as people often worry about the drugs bill, and indeed you'll see in here, there's quite a bit about the drugs bill, but it's also about patients and outcomes and things like that, which you will be only too familiar with. So I would say that medicines are truly wonderful, aren't they? And you know, in an audience like this, um, I would hope that you would think that medicines are truly wonderful. And of course, it's only in the 1950s, doesn't seem that far away uh, for some of us. Um, and uh, you know, people were still prescribing in Latin, uh, we were sort of using things like grains. Um, the apothecary's ounce was uh, 480 grains, and we had things like mist um, on et epicap, uh, those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, sort of it was then, I guess, in the 1960s when, for example, James Black uh, discovered propranolol um, and indeed went on uh, for a number of other things to win the Nobel Prize around that. But then, of course, in amongst that was thalidomide. Um, and in the 1960s and all that that meant, you know, first emerging in sort of the early 60s, um, uh, and then it took until 1968 to get something called the Medicines Act in place, which was really the sort of first time there was a, some real regulation around um, medicines and their development. Um, and of course, sort of from that time onwards, you're sort of seeing increasing in complexity around medication uh, development, uh, discovery, uh, and use. You know, whether sort of whilst we're a bit behind, and I'll mention, as you might expect, antibiotics at some point um, in terms of the uh, pipeline around antibiotics. But for other things, you know, for example, the sort of monoclonal antibodies of the 1990s now and 2000s. Um, and sort of the sort of beginnings, finally, of the emergence of pharmacogenomics. Um, I've heard that across my career um, for a long time, um, uh, but it's beginning to feel a little bit more real. Um, we have a genomics um, uh, program across the NHS, and when you look at things like transducimab and the like, you can sort of begin to see that actually genomics is really going to sort of make a big, a big impact. But the sort of, um, and of course, alongside that, of course, is the, how the industry itself has developed um, and research generally around the sort of analytical and discovery techniques and the things you can do these days, which you certainly couldn't do in the 1950s. Um, and so this sort of 
increasing complexity. Um, I think, I don't know, anybody read the Washington Post on Saturday? <laughs> no? <laughs> so I did this morning via Twitter. Um, and um, there's an article which I'd recommend to you, actually, uh, in the uh, Washington Post on Saturday talking about America's other big drug problem, and that being older people taking too many pills, um, calling it America's other uh, prescription drug epidemic. Um, and when you sort of look at this country, actually, and some of the numbers and figures which are quoted in that particular article, I just wonder whether it's not uh, um, a little worse here. Um, and when you sort of then put into, take into account some of the facts we know, so for example, the rate of admission to hospitals caused by medicines which could be prevented on average, we think from the literature, Around 5 to 8%, um, I say from the literature, we're in the process of developing some metrics. I'll come on to that um, at some point. Um, but if you're over 75, it, the literature suggests that that rate doubles. Um, uh, and then when you sort of put it in the context of um, antimicrobial resistance, um, it's something, again, that's been across... My career, I've worked with three CMOs, um, and um, this particular CMO um, uh, has taken it even more seriously than the sort of past uh, CMOs. Uh, and again, I've got a slide on antimicrobial resistance, but it's a sort of part of that, that uh, context. And then when you put sort of adherence alongside of that, and nice telling us that up to 50% of uh, patients don't take medicines as intended, you know, we've known about that for a little while, and then when you then look at this issue about over-prescribing polypharmacy, the sort of, uh, I've got again a slide later which will show you that the average 85-year-old in primary care is being dispensed regularly 12 medicines on average, um, 12 individual medicines, 85. Um, and so this sort of concept of de-prescribing actually has sort of gone global in many ways and Canada and Australia are a little bit ahead of the game in some ways. And you can sort of see that glide path to this happening uh, around sort of you know, you all know as well as I do, a sort of someone being treated for, uh, uh, as with a hypertensive, a bit like me, that's all I take at the moment, um, but then suddenly needing a diuretic and, and then perhaps they need something for their potassium issue as well as a result of that. Um, it's a sort of, uh, you know, that glide path is well known. But I would add to that some other policy things, like, for example, NICE, like, for example, Quaff like, for example, some of the medical or legal issues that we, we sort of are all having to sort of confront. Let alone communication. There's a particular issue I'm dealing with, I've had for the last couple of years, um, on the inappropriate use of antipsychotics in people with learning, dif learning difficulty. A sort of real vulnerable group, and um, there's no doubt strong evidence about overuse of antipsychotics in that group. Um, and there's now a campaign to um, try and reduce that. And essentially, if you look at the data, if you're female, um, uh, as you're old, the chance, as you're getting older, the chances of you being, and you've got a learning disability, the chances are you're going to be uh, prescribed an antipsychotic, perhaps less so these days because of what we're trying to do about it, and you're going to die younger. And that feels to me a sort of very classic example of of what the issue is here. So whilst the drugs bill, and I um, move to this slide to give you a feel for how the drugs, drugs bill has increased over the last few years. Um, as of uh, recently data, 17.4 billion pounds a year in this country spent on medicines. That's one pound in every seven that the NHS spends. It's the biggest cost off the staff. It's also, and importantly, a major part of the U of UK PLC and the economy. And therefore, the sort of the sort of desire, even stronger, obviously, with Brexit around uh, to create the sort of uh, circumstances such that um, uh, uh, we have an ongoing and strong relationship with the innovative pharmaceutical industry and indeed the generics pharmaceutical industry. Then um, I think you can see that this this sort of spend is becoming more and more important. Um, it always has been, to be honest, um, but when we also put that in the context of the financial situation that we find the NHS in, NHS in right now, 
um, and with a drugs bill which will be 20 billion in a not too distant future then you can sort of see that they sort of put all this together you know the money uh, the sort of I would describe as a public health issue associated with overuse of medication uh, and some of the other things I've mentioned whether it's AMR um, adherence uh, indeed wastage um, and of course you know when you think about you may you might not know but it's generally accepted in the pharmacy world I'm not sure in the clinical pharmacology world it may well be that there's a five percent year-on-year volume increase and has been of medicines and their use for many years um, and not only that everybody used to talk about primary care being the big spender um, it won't be long before secondary care becomes uh, a greater spend overall than, um, than primary care. Um, but of course the volume of medication use is very much in primary care. Those sort of wonderful new sexy medicines which we all sort of uh, um, see in our practice uh, are absolutely phenomenal in terms of what difference they make. But the bulk of treatment, as we know, still remains, you know, embedded medicines, um, uh, the volume of which largely generic. So I think the sort of um, this rate of increase of uh, medication use in, in terms of spend in um, uh, uh, secondary care sort of adds to this sort of, um, this sort of uh, whole atmosphere of we really need to sort of get a grip of, of this. And so you would have heard, I'm sure, many people talking about value. Um, and if we're spending 20 billion a year or the best part of it, let's try and get the best value out of it. I think patients would expect that. Um, taxpayers would expect that too. Um, and, you know, everybody has their own definition of value. Um, this is just the one we're putting together at the moment around um, value around medicines, measurable improvement in patient outcomes whilst uh, maintaining an affordable drugs bill, so it's all about access, um, it's all about choice, um, but it's also about quality, so Bruce Keogh's definition of quality and safety, clinical effectiveness and patient experience, and it says of prescribing and medicines use, but it's not just prescribing, it's the whole medicines use pathway, so prescribing and the reasons to get to that point, um, administration of medicines, dispensing and uh, ultimately use by patients uh, of medicines. Um, and then if you're going to do this really well, what you've got to do is think about it as a system overall and let's tr therefore try and make the way we purchase medicines and supply them as efficient as possible while still maintaining the sort of NHS's world leadership in certain areas around medicines, uh, uh, discovery, development and a sort of desire to become an even stronger sort of part of that. Um, when you look at the industrial strategy, which some of you may or may not have heard about or seen, I'd, again, I'd encourage you to read it, you will see that the pharmaceutical industry rightly is an important part of um, the sort of future in terms of UK PLC, uh, but also the devices industry too, amongst many, amongst many others. So it's in that context that we have pulled together something which we call the Medicines Value Programme. And um, I guess um, uh, you'll be familiar with the um, forward five-year forward view, which also identified these quality financial public health gaps, um, which we need to respond to uh, against this ever-challenging uh, fiscal environment. Um, and there's sort of uh, a number of things going on. Some of you may be familiar with something called um, uh, Lord Carter's report around productivity uh, in the uh, uh, NHS, um, particularly in hospitals. Um, and that has a specific medicines optimization work strand within it. Um, but ultimately, we just want to, it's all very simple, really. We just want to help people get the best results from their medicines. It's pretty much as simple as that. Um, but achieving best value for the taxpayer at the same time. Uh, and then if you can also sort of do that really well, then you can create some headroom to invest in other things, whether that's other newer medicines or indeed supporting the NHS more broadly. And that is even why it's even more important. So the sort of medicines value programme has... Um, 
four strands to it. Firstly, the sort of policy framework that governs access to and pricing uh, of medicines. Um, the second one is everything, the commercial side of life and the need to sort of think about that, um, uh, and rightly so, because um, certainly the pharmaceutical industry think about the commercial side of life, and therefore so should the NHS if we're going to do, get the best uh, value for taxpayers. Um, then there's a sort of a strand which is around actually when, when, uh, how do you actually get the best out of that, um, uh, that huge investment um, by optimising the use of medicines, working with professionals, working with managers, working with patients um, to get the best outcomes. And then if you're going to do it, then let's make the infrastructure which supports it all, whether it's digital or otherwise, um, as efficient as possible. So, simple. Um, and not only that, you have to do that in the context of a wide range of interests, um, uh, of which NHS England is one. And so we have brought together all the sort of various interests across the system in sort of project management terms in a, in a program board. And indeed, you'll see that this, uh, this program features um, in the NHS efficiency plan uh, and talks about 10 point efficiency plan. And then, so coordinated nationally, and then implemented regionally and locally, which I'll mention in a moment. I think a specific mention here of the AHSNs, um, I think it, um, you know, basically a five million population per AHSN, roughly. Um, and you can sort of see how, if you can get this right and use the AHSNs, as well as other bits of systems around implementation, that sort of population gives you a real sort of, um, uh, sort of a real advantage, I think, in what is a semi-integrated health system um, compared to others if you're going to do research and development. Um, it seems to me that's about the right sort of population level. So, first one then, the, um, the policy framework that governs access to and pricing of medicines. So we're working with the various... Uh, uh, um, parts of the system, particularly the Department of Health, who lead on something called the Pharmaceutical Price Regulation Scheme, which is the, the deal that's done with uh, industry, and there's been something called the PPRS for the last 50 years, one way or another, um, and um, which is a sort of balance between value for the taxpayer, but also um, uh, what's, uh, what's good for UK PLC. This more new kid on the block is something called the Office of Life Sciences, OLS, who led on the development of the industrial strategy, you'll be familiar with NICE and MHRA. But the way you bring all that together to ensure that there's fair and actual, equitable access uh, to medicines. I have to say, though, it's not just um, the, the branded uh, pharmaceutical industry we're thinking about here, or branded pharmaceuticals. For all the reasons I've mentioned previously, of course, when you sort of think about admissions to hospitals in the top four or five drugs, whether that's warfarin, um, non-steroidals, um, diuretics, um, ACE inhibitors, or whatever it might be, then, of course, they're all generics. And so it's actually where the volume is um, in primary care, where we do have particular issues associated with medicines. And, of course, in primary care as well, generics is a much bigger spend than in, than in secondary care. You would expect that in many ways. Um, so, and in the main, when you get into that, then um, we, the way we pay for medicines in hospitals is different to the way we pay for medicines in primary care. In hospitals, I like to think we sort of own the medicines, sort of, um, and are essentially trust by medicines um, and the pharmacy department does that. Um, but when you're in primary care, then all we do is reimburse community pharmacy and dispensing doctors. So we don't buy the medicines, the NHS, we reimburse. And we put incentives in the system to make sure that's ideally done as efficiently as possible. There's one or two little blips at the moment, um, but um, which is causing us some concerns, a combination of shortages, and, uh, and what you're dealing with around generics in primary care is a commodity market. It's, you know, it's um, uh, different because it's medicines, but it is a commodity market and prices go up and down. So um, it's how do you then sort of pull that together in a framework where you're working much closer with NICE. The relation, one of the things about having something called NHS England as an arm's length body, 
is you can create a very sort of different relationship with nice. Um, when I was in the department, then, you know, the relationship was different in terms of government to ALB type of relationship, as opposed to an ALB to an ALB. And that sort of slight independence and what that can do in terms of having a different um, uh, sort of discussion with NICE about how things are done. And from a policy point of view, that's really important. The next is the sort of um, commercial arrangements. Um, so I mentioned the first strand, the policy framework. This is the second strand, the Medicines Value Programme. So the commercial arrangements that influence price. And you'll be familiar with this sort of way that medicines come onto the market and, and what happens as a result of that. So, um, so for example, you know, when it's exclusive to the market, then PPRS, sort of, sorry, the Pharmaceutical Price Regulation Scheme is very much right at the centre of pricing. Um, but then as p competitors come along uh, or emerging, then there are extended indications. Um, towards competitors themselves and substitute where the market sort of then starts to really impact on price until ultimately the patent goes and uh, generics emerge. But in order to sort of make the most of that across that sort of period of time, we need to be thinking about how relationship with industry uh, and with others across that period of time. We need to make sure our horizon scanning is good um, in order to be able to plan but then align processes in the way I mentioned uh, with NICE. Um, but also sort of um, because we can um, think differently because we have this thing called NHS England, what we're also doing is boosting very significantly the commercial capacity and capability, as people say these days, in NHS England itself, i.e. people that can deal commercially with the pharmaceutical industry, whether that's um, uh, generics or branded. And you would have seen in the recent times NHS England making announcements about um, the deals it has done with the pharmaceutical industry for those in specialised commissioning. And the sort of um, how that sort of single front door which we're creating for the industry to come and talk to NHS England about um, pricing of pharmaceuticals is now really beginning to kick in. Um, uh, and you'll be familiar maybe with um, some of the sort of arrangements around hep C drugs, um, but other things too, some of the cancer medicines and what have you. And again, post-Brexit and with the industrial strategy in mind, um, then that is all very, very relevant indeed. How do you maximise that value? The national sort of procurement value, the sort of maximum sort of size that's got a really good deal for the, for the NHS as a whole, while still also working closely with industry in order to sort of um, uh, sort of create the sort of relationships needed um, to um, promote um, research in, in the UK. The next one is optimising use of medicines. Um, and this little diagram on the right here is something that's sort of been sort of I think sort of grown up in the pharmacy world, um, and I'd like to think you all knew what it was, but um, in the sort of, <laughs> in sort of policy terms, this is really important, um, because this represents a, a new way of thinking about medicines and their use. Um, some of you will be familiar with something I don't even know what it's called anymore, I think it's called medicines management. Um, <laughs> don't do that anymore. Um, because medicines management, um, whether we like it or not, and I was sort of, for my sins, um, one of the sort of instigators of that term, um, then um, it, over a period of time has become not exclusively financially focused, but in the end became particularly financially focused. And you can see in the, the sort of background I've described already why that was good enough for the time, but now it isn't. Um, we have to get much more patient-centred, outcome-based, value-driven, where in a sort of system where it's, we're using medicines in a, a very clear evidence-based way where it's safe, this becomes part of what you do. And not only that, you're measuring and monitoring what you're doing and the outcomes that are generated. So it's the Royal Pharmaceutical Society working with various medical royal colleges, the pharmaceutical industry, and a lot of patient groups which came up with that 
uh, and that is really a sort of summary of the what has now been adopted as the NHS policy around medicines and getting best outcomes. Um, but that sort of is driving a lot of what we're doing, not just prescribing, but administration, drug administration as well. Uh, but you know, the sort of need to support patients to get the best out of their medication and also to review some medicines every now and then to sort of make sure that medicines are still needed. Um, and I've mentioned this concept of deep scribing, which is largely global. Now, it's a problem in this country. It's a problem everywhere. But there are sort of specific examples, some of which I've got in a moment I'll, I'll mention, so which you can begin to operationalise this. Sort of, so dose-banded chemotherapy would be a good example of where you're sort of trying to make everything as efficient as possible. You're still going to get a great outcome for patients, but you can sort of make, do it in a much more efficient way um, in terms of the preparation that's needed to actually get that chemotherapy to someone. But there's also things called biosimilars, I certainly will mention in a moment. Um, you know, great medicines, let's try and increase uh, access to them, uh, uh, these biological medicines, whilst um, saving something of the order of 300 million pounds. Um, so, uh, and we're doing sort of um, quite a lot around care homes, use of medicines. Um, you know, let's try and get some skills into care homes and give them some attention because we know that's where there are some issues with medicines and their use. And let alone you put all AMR in amongst that. Uh, and if you can get AMR embedded in this way of working, so the NHS really sort of recognises it, not just as a public health issue, but as something that is driven to sort of uh, get better outcomes and ultimately dealing with the sort of biggest public health threat there is, then uh, why wouldn't you sort of get that into this sort of framework as well? So we've set up four regional medicines optimization committees. Uh, to help us with that. So it's okay me sort of talking about this stuff in my ivory tower, um, but that's how do we operationalize this? And this is part of the delivery arm. Um, so the regional medical directors um, chair these committees. Um, the idea is, is that to try and work closely with CCGs and trusts, particularly the area prescribing committees, the drug and therapeutics committees and the like, to sort of offer them advice, no decision, just advice, um, from a clinical point of view, uh, in terms of how do you sort of operationalise some of the things I've mentioned. So you reduce duplication at a local level, get as much as you can to this regional level to allow colleagues, whether pharmacists, medics or anybody else, uh, at a local level, to have a bit more time to be able to get on and do this sort of stuff and not just be thinking about writing the next guideline for X and doing that a couple of hundred times across the across the country. Um, how do you actually sort of um, then disseminate that in a sort of joined up way um, and provide this sort of consistent advice and then you support it with something which I commission called the specialist pharmacy service which we spend about six million pounds on so it's all the medicines in regional medicines information departments and one or two other things to support this to become the delivery arm for medicines optimization. It's early days um, they've met they've had one uh, round each um, and they're just starting to get into get, get into sort of um, action they, they uh, uh, what the North Regional Medicine Committee produced um, some guidance on something called Freestyle Libra, a device, um, and um, that seems to have um, had an impact um, in terms of um, its sort of acceptance in the North and then how it's been a real test for us, to be honest, about how you get these four committees essentially so they may be four committees but are actually one working together sharing agendas sharing output so you do all this once um, and not have an industry at local level repeating all this while still ma making sure that you do get the local ownership so that you can get things done in practice locally so um and here's what the RMOC looks like. It's you. I, I wonder about the size of these committees, I have to say. Um, they are um, large. Um, I went to the one in the West Midlands, sorry, Midlands and East the other day, um, and um, it's significantly in terms of size. There's a clinical pharmacologist on each committee, at least in one, I think in London there are a couple actually, two, three in fact, Emma Sellamy. So, um, so Jamie Coleman, for example, is on uh, Midlands and East, I see he's on the agenda later. Um, 
but there are uh, clinical pharmacologists on each, but also a plethora of other people to try and create this sort of collaborative approach to give authoritative clinical support and guidance so that people can get on with it then locally. Um, easy to say, not easy to do. Um, we've also made some appointments to support that, so there are now four regional uh, pharmacists um, who work jointly across NHS England and NHS Improvement, and there are four, also four regional HEE pharmacists, Health Education England pharmacists, um, to support the sort of workforce matters in amongst this, because uh, their brief is not just pharmacy, but medicines used more broadly. Um, and that's, that's how it is. I mean, at the moment, that's a significant number of people. Let's see how it goes. But the, um, the intention is right, um, and I'm sure they'll do a great job. Um, and as these sort of issues start to emerge. I thought I'd just mention safety, since, um, you know, uh, that feels to me quite an important issue. Um, and it's now also, and has been rightly, an important issue for the Secretary of State, um, who I think has done a great job in raising um, the profile of patient safety and doing something about it. Um, and in amongst that, um, uh, some of you may be familiar that there was a WHO report produced quite uh, recently, their third patient uh, safety global challenge, um, and it's on medication error. Um, and Secretary of State, I'm working closely with Secretary of State, which sounds pretty grand, but I am, um, to sort of uh, develop a program of work around medication error and safety. Um, and one of our early focuses is likely to be this issue of people being admitted to hospital when they didn't need to be. Uh, and that's where we're developing a set of metrics. And if you think about the sort of, you know, my comments at the beginning about the early days. So it was in, it was in the 1960s that um, Duncan Veer, who was a, who was a pharmacologist, um, was working at the London Hospital and invented something called a drug chart. Um, and this combined prescription and administration on one piece of paper and he, with the pharmacy department there, put ward pharmacists together with that and lo and behold, the prescribing error rate went down, uh, as did the drug administration error rate. Um, but when we then sort of bring that a bit more up to date and the GMC's work around prescribing error uh, in the medical profession, um, so about up to about 9% in secondary care, 5% in primary care, um, and you think about drug administration, probably the bit of the process we know most of, the uh, drug administration error rate about 4% roughly on average. Um, these are all observational studies. Um, dispensing we know less about, um, primary, because until well, shortly this is going to be sorted, it's strict criminal liability um, around dispensing errors and unsurprisingly therefore reporting and learning is um, a little bit more difficult, but we're in the process of sorting that with legislation going through Parliament as we speak. Um, so th essentially we're going, we're going to be launching a medication error programme um, uh, which will probably will be in the early spring, um, but you can see this is long, long overdue and the WHO now are sort of uh, supporting that too globally. I mentioned biosimilars, uh, it's worth to a specific mention of biosimilars, I think. So six of the, ten, six of the top 10 medicines in this country are, bio, are biological medicines. Um, so, and many of them are coming off patent. Um, uh, important medicines, as I mentioned earlier, um, really you know, disease modifying, as you all know, important medicines, um, uh, but expensive. Um, how can we, you know, now they're coming off patent, we can actually start to sort of think about how can we get more of these medicines in use whilst also saving a considerable amount of money. They're not normal generics, as I'm sure you know. They're manufactured by what I call sophisticated brewing, um, as opposed to um, sort of a typical tab tablet. So they vary from batch to batch, and that has to be controlled and so forth. And the regulators require us to uh, prescribe them um, by brand name. But, you know, in 2018, the world's number one drug is coming off patent. That's called ad adalimumab. Um, and we're all preparing for that in terms of the opportunity that it gives for patients, but also for taxpayers. And then in due course, in about 2022, I think it is, something called uh, bevacizumab and various other, those types of medicines for wet AMD also came off patent. And I think that also, for those of you who are familiar with um, some of the issues associated with those medicines, um, that is obviously going to help. And to give you a feel for um, 
the uh, sort of scale of saving, not just a sort of, this is the lost opportunity actually from, uh, these are from infliximab intanacept in terms of, this is the amount of money we were losing month by month by not switching to the most best value biological. Um, and as you can see, that adds up to quite a few tens of millions of pounds. So this process of something coming off patent and then the markets created for a biological medicine, how do you quickly get into, into practice while dealing with, with patients who do not want their medicine swapped um, constantly but get best value for the NHS and best outcomes for patients? So, it's a, so we, are, we have launched this... Um, a commissioning framework which is designed to do precisely that. Um, so as I mentioned, we think there's about 300 million pounds of savings over the next few years, but also it, by using the best value biologic medicine. Um, we've also put out some guidance, particularly for managers called what is a biosimilar, um, working closely and so that managers understand the importance of these med medicines and working closely with industry and patients and regulators and uh, the, whoever else wants to talk to us um, to sort of set out this commissioning framework so system-wide in order to sort of make the best of uh, this sort of changing market for biological medicines. And how do you do that? Well, supported by those things I mentioned called the Regional Medicines Optimization Committee, so a local process around change. Um, so you sort of look to see what the scale of the opportunity might be. You work together across the system. You engage with patients, um, probably through a sort of patient uh, group, local patient group. You think about implementation, and then you monitor how well you're doing. And our role, I think, is to support that process through data packs and various things from the regional medicines committees and specific tailored product uh, advice, if you see what I mean. And then a touch of performance management from NHS improvement in order to make sure that everything is going okay and as well as can be expected. And here's a case study for, for that. Um, so this is from Southampton. Anybody from Southampton here? No? Okay. Um, so this is not far from my, my local hospital, so this makes me even happier. Um, so essentially, um, for uh, it's switching people to um, the biosimilar of for infliximab, um, and how you do that, and what how what you need in order to do it. So, for example, you share the sort of savings across the system, so you can then employ people like extra nurses or pharmacists in the sort of in this case. Um, GI um, uh, department, see more patients, make the switch happen, but get more of these medicines to people, clinically led, um, and with strong patient engagement, strong monitoring around pharmacovigilance, um, and lo and behold, you save some money and you provide better care. Job done. Of course, every now and then, uh, it seems particularly in England we have to do this, not in Scotland, um, we have to put um, uh, incentives in the system to, to make some of these things work. And in this case, it's um, around that biological medicine, so sort of with a target, if you like, to um, uh, how quickly you can switch people to the best value biologic medicine and include that, that also in, uh, implies a certain generics like the sort of imatinib came off patent recently and that this incentive has helped with the sort of accelerating that process. So that sort of whole thing of having a policy framework, getting clinical leadership and then putting some financial incentives in the system to sort of make these things happen which delivers better care uh, about also, and better outcomes but also saves some money for the taxpayer. In chemotherapy, I've mentioned dose banding. So I can remember when I was chief pharmacist in, um, at UHB, um, so looking across the West Midlands as it was at the time, there were something like 46 versions of 5-FU being manufactured uh, across, the, across that to meet in, you know, particular needs and ways of doing things when you probably only needed one or two, which means you could then bring all this preparation and manufacture of 5-FU together and do it a lot more efficiently. Um, and that is called dose banding. Um, and in terms of agreeing the dose levels at which, you know, 
uh, on a milligram per kilogram basis where you, you're confident that the outcome is going to be fine. Um, and you end up sort of um, with a considerable um, efficiency, um, both in terms of uh, regionally but locally as well, in terms of uh, getting patients through the system. It's something when I look back on my 30 odd years in pharmacy that this has been an issue for that amount of time. And, then, and we've made some stride forward every now and then. But it seems to me now you've got this incentive, a, a clinical leadership system, where we can actually make this happen. And on generics, um, uh, then here's some data from the something called um, the Business Services Agency um, Authority, which um, which pays community pharmacies. And one of the one of the good things about paying community pharmacies for the medicines they dispense is you get the data uh, about sort of um, what's actually being used. Um, and here, this sort of thing around speed of switch to the best value generic without sort of and get, you know going too far with it um, uh, then you can see the sort you can begin to make some considerable savings again uh, while still um, not impacting on patient outcomes and there are various uh, data systems to use to help people with that and some of you may or may not be familiar with something called epact which is the NHS sort of way of looking at this in uh, in uh, CCGs, but there's also open source information like openprescribing.net, you know, run by Ben Goldacre from Oxford, which is you know, proving to be um, um, just as useful uh, as other systems as well in order to sort of drive this change. And then when I sort of think about waste in amongst this, so this is three days collection from two pharmacies, I think it is, something like that, um, uh, of return medication. Um, the only sort of real, the most, well, the most, the, the decent study around medication waste was done about uh, six, seven years ago by the department, and or commissioned by the department, which found in primary care wastage of something in the order of 300 million, about half of which was recoverable. In other words, could be could be sort of recovered and. Um, uh, utilised not in terms of re recycling medication, but could be uh, could be done, something could be done about it to reduce that waste. Um, but we all know about it in terms of both whether it's adherence, over prescribing, over dispensing. Uh, there's a sort of a, a real issue of waste um, around medicines uh, in this country. And some CCGs uh, and localities, in fact, many have tried to tackle this through campaigns and you know with posters on the sides of buses and radio sort of things and all this, but it's still, the bottom line is we haven't got the sort of checks and balances right in the system in order to prevent this. And then it's not surprising when you then see this data, again from the BSA, um, about um, polypharmacy. So um, it's working our way, so the, on average, this is CCG variation across the country, the number of average number of medicines that people are being dispensed, individual medicines, about five overall, but as you go up in age, so 65 is about 9, uh, 75 is approaching uh, 12, and um, 85 or over, on average, 12 or more medicines. You tell me why someone over the age of 85 really needs 12 or more medicines. Why does a 93-year-old need a statin? I just do not, do not sort of buy it, I'm afraid. Um, it needs to be tackled carefully and respectfully, but that one way or another, this needs to be tackled. And it can be. Um, I can get that to work. So here's a sort of case study from Ealing, not too far from here, about, in this case, putting pharmacists into a multidisciplinary team with general practitioners, nurses, and working with care home staff and care home residents and their carers or relatives and you can actually sort of get some incredible reductions in the use of medication um, you know 63 percent reduction in antipsychotics um, overall sort of a significant reduction in uh, medicines use overall sometimes of course it's about more you know more medicines if they need, people need them, or residents need them, but one way or another, this has made a significant impact, and that's why um, it's not just here, it's elsewhere in the country, we'll shortly be um, rolling out, putting some pharmacists into, into care homes uh, to sort of work in a multidisciplinary way to sort of give people that focus and expertise that's needed to get this done.
And then, of course, there's sort of things which we find ourselves prescribing in the NHS, but actually are um, perhaps of whether well, less value overall. Um, and you may have been, it's been on the news quite a lot. So here's this fits in the medicines value program. So NHS England consulted on about 18 medicines um, as to whether they should be routinely prescribed in primary care. That uh, decision and guidance was out last week or two in terms of the consultation response and um, with a sort of sensible decision, in my view, to keep lyothionine in play um, and to put that, but to ask um, consultants to sort of take on the prescribing of lyothionine, but for some things to sort of say, well, actually, Coproximal was taken out of the NHS about uh, 10 or so years ago, if not more, um, and we still find ourselves with a significant amount of Coproximal being prescribed and used in this country. So, you know, it was taken out of the, of the system for good toxicological reasons um, let alone anything else. So, um, and we will also be consulting at the end of January on sort of why on earth do we need um, over-the-counter medicines um, which can be bought um, um, uh, prescribed. The answer to that is, well, some people um, may only be able to... Um, uh, they get free prescriptions for good reason and therefore... Um, perhaps they need these over-the-counter medicines. But on the other hand, there is also um, perhaps evidence that we're going to have to make some decisions somehow about some things which people may have to buy in future. Also, um, under the Regional Medicines Optimisation Committees, but much bigger, um, is the UK AMR strategy. Uh, I... Um, I really uh, am a great admirer of Sally Davis in that the way she has taken this particular issue and uh, it really has gone global because it is a global issue. Mm -hmm. She now co-chairs a sort of um, a UN group amongst many others uh, at an international level really beginning to address this at a global level. Um, and in, uh, in this country I find myself as the SRO, Senior Responsible Officer, for um, reducing... Um, uh, inappropriate antibiotic, I'm sorry, antimicrobial prescribing by 50% um, by 2020-21. And indeed we're doing pretty well in primary care, there's always more to do, but there's been a 7% reduction overall in, in prescribing of antibiotics in primary care and real changes in practice, the sort of balance between trimethoprim and nitrofurantoin for UTI, for example. So there's sort of been some real real changes. Um, uh, but in secondary care, it's been a bit more complex, not least because there's been shortages of particular medicines. PIPTAS, for example, if you like the biggest ecological experiment, seems to me there is at the moment in terms of what, that, what the impact of that is going to be on, on resistance. But let's not fool ourselves. Resistance, the risk associated with resistance is increasing. So why do I say that? Not just because resistance is increasing in this country, but abroad to some parts of Europe, China and the Far East, and bugs travel. So we need to do more, in my view, around, um, and not just, of course, in prescribing, but in animal health, in diagnostics, and in the new strategy I think we're going to see, which is coming at the end of next year, we're going to see a whole work program around the environment. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're doing okay, but we can't relax. Indeed, we need to do more because bugs travel and resistance increases, is, is increasing. So we need to do more. The mitigations need to be even stronger. I couldn't come here without just sort of saying something about um, pharmacy. Um, and I'd like to think, working with clinical pharmacologists and others, that the pharmacy profession, pharmacists, in particular, have um, sort of something to offer in terms of expertise around medicines and their use. Um, and hence, we're trying to sort of get pharmacists, clinical pharmacists, much more engaged and integrated into the NHS. You'll be used to working with clinical pharmacists in hospitals. That's been rolled out for the last 30, 40 years. It's relatively new in primary care, but we are putting 2,000 clinical pharmacists into general practices. Um, it'll be about 600 or so, something like that, into care homes. Um, about 150 into urgent care hubs to sort of get this sort of integration working and start to working with others, others address some of the issues um, that I've been mentioning. 
And finally, the sort of um, the infrastructure theme. So that was all optimization. Uh, so now on to infrastructure. Um, a couple of slides only on this, um, you'll be pleased to know. Um, and you know, what can we do to sort of get the sort of efficient the supply chain as efficient as possible? Um, so whether that's in hospital pharmacy, where we're encouraging sort of the merger of pharmacy stores and things like that into bigger sites across a bigger area. Why do you need one in every pharmacy? You know, um, you know, how can we get the sort of that to sort of work even even sort of more efficiently so we can free up some of the pharmacists to do even more clinical things, that type of thing. But also workforce development more broadly. So um, I'm, I'm familiar, the BPS is working closely uh, with HEE uh, and the faculty, I think, uh, of pharmaceutical medicine to sort of ensure that the numbers of clinical pharmacologists are right for the future in the NHS, particularly in the context of not just this, but Brexit and UK PLC. So um, that's great to see. Um, uh, but also, how do you actually make the supply in primary care as efficient as possible? And some of you would have seen some, um, some concern from our, my community pharmacy colleagues about how we're going about that. Um, and, um, but one way or another, um, there is a need to make the community pharmacy network and supply chain even more efficient than it already is. And not only that, of course, underpinning all that is digital. This is the Carter program in, in the hospital part of the Medicines Value program. So essentially the plan is to try and make some savings, yes, but the whole idea is to free up um, uh, clinical pharmacists so they, and the pharmacy workforce so that 80% of their time becomes clinical. Working with you, working with uh, other uh, medics, with nurses, with managers to sort of get a much more, even a, a much bigger focus on, on medicines in hospitals, let alone anywhere else. E-prescribing is sort of in amongst this, it's in safety as well. We, we have about a third of hospitals across the country which have e-prescribing deployed. Um, it's debatable how many of those are actually using e-prescribing well, i.e. optimise as another strand of work, um, but it really is blindingly obvious <coughs> that we need e-prescribing and drug administration across all hospitals. I think that's going to cost about 100 million and I'm trying to convince people and I'm grateful for any help uh, that um, that is going to be a really important and well spent 100 million pounds. We're not quite there yet. Um, so just on the digital, which at the moment is labelled around community pharmacy in particular, but actually we're in the process of reshaping this to support the Medicines Value Programme. Um, and um, you'll be familiar, and I'm sure, in, if, you know, for those of you who have the need to go to a GP, that more than likely than not you are able to get an electronic prescription, um, which a pharmacy can draw down from the spine. Um, but there are other things as well around sort of making that sort of a bit better, a bit more reliable. Um, and then I think this is probably the most important part, secondary uses of medicines, uh, uh, secondary uses of data. Um, so um, you'll be even more familiar with me of just how important outcome data, real world data is going to be and already is. Um, so that's captured in this bit of the program. Um, I'm the business sponsor for this, um, uh, in fact, this whole digital thing. Um, and how can we actually support both an efficient supply chain, whether home care or whatever it might be, with good data? Um, again, nothing other than the blindly obvious, but we've been going at it for a while. Um, it would be nice to get this sorted once and for all. And then I think this is my final slide. Um, how do you then sort of, again, it talks about pharmacy, but it's bigger than pharmacy. How do you actually sort of get, in this case, in primary care, but linked get community pharmacy, but then medicines use more broadly, much more integrated into the NHS in a way which in many ways it hasn't been uh, with a number of projects which are associated with that. <coughs> so there you go. There's a whistle stop to uh, through uh, the Medicines Value Programme. Um, I truly believe that clinical pharmacology has a really important role to play here. Um, I hope that it's going to be a bit more than the regional medicines optimization committees. I hope that you are going to sort of work with pharmacists and others uh, in a collaborative manner across the system to sort of help make this happen. Because at the end of the day, when you look at some of the data around patient outcomes I've showed you, then I just think we all need to work together to get that done and sorted. Thank you.